So, um, uh, thank you for, for letting me uh, to, uh, to be here in, in, in this journal club. Uh, it's my very first uh, presentation here, so um, I really don't know if, um, if, uh, if it is good enough or, or not, but I, I, will, I will just have a live experience with you. So um, uh, I, um, I I really thank Ada for for helping me for the previous week uh, for selecting the appropriate uh, article or uh, research that we could discuss in, in uh, this way. So I, I my plan is like to have a brief summary like in fifteen minutes, nothing more, uh, about the uh, the uh, study in hand, and then we start uh, the discussion. Um, the article was published like in um, April uh, 2020 at uh, Nature's, at Nature's uh, Neurology. Uh, and the main uh, question in hand, or the critical question that the study tried to answer was, uh, does the timing or, uh, of initiation of high efficacy disease modifying treatment uh, has an effect on long-term disability uh, uh, on uh, active relapsing MS patients? Uh, so the, the critical question in hand was where they were, where there'll be any long-term benefit from starting early, uh, um, again, it's starting uh, somewhat late in the treatment course on the disease course of uh, MS patients. So the study was, um, was uh, um, a retrospective uh, observational cohort uh, from two uh, different sites or two main uh, cohort, patient cohorts, like I will come in the next few minutes. Uh, just right before this publication, uh, the key literature uh, addressing uh, this issue was available uh, in a way or another. In 2017, there was a meta-analysis about the age-dependent efficacy of MS treatments, and they came out with the conclusion that the high-efficacy uh, therapy is only effective uh, below the age of 40, as far as uh, the meta-analysis suggests. Uh, also, before uh, just right before this publication, back in 2019, uh, the, the, uh, there was a single center uh, observational cohort from Cardiff uh, reports um, that um, uh, uh, compared the outcome between escalation therapy versus early intensive uh, disease modifying treatment with the positive uh, results uh, suggesting for uh, starting escalation, the, uh, starting high efficacy treatments early in, uh, in, uh, in uh, early in MS patients, in active MS patients. Um, at the time being, there are two uh, ongoing clinical trials uh, addressing this particular issues. Both are uh, North American, uh, expected to uh, end like in 2022, if I remember correctly, and 2023, uh, comparing uh, a list of uh, high efficacy treatment compared to the standard escalation uh, therapy for for, uh, for MS patients and randomized and a prospective uh, clinical trials. I think these, the results of these uh, two trials will be um, intuitive. So um, the study design went in this way. So they have a, 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 a very large sample of patients from MS-based registry, the, the well-known um, registry project. Uh, so for, and they selected uh, uh, patients with uh, who started high efficacy treatment at any point in time at that stage of uh, analysis. And they also included the Swedish MS uh, registry. So uh, at, at the end, you find a very large number of, uh, of patients, uh, like um, uh, 8,070, more than 70 patients, uh, a quite large number, like you, you, you don't find such number in, in MS trials, uh, rather than you may find it in a cerebrovascular disease trials or so. So they, yeah, but they, they don't. Didn't you find it very remarkable how what a low number of people was they could finally that finally only matched their inclusion criteria because they have eight thousand seven hundred potential candidates and there were only two hundred fifty people in each group. Yes, so only yes, two hundred fifty yes. people. They, they had they, full data. So it, I think it's very indicative about the quality of these registries. Uh, yes, it gives it. Yeah, yeah, of course. And, and, uh, and I think this is a small point because they allow them to uh, apply a stringent criteria for inclusion, for the data quality, and also for statistics because they, at the end, they had to do some uh, propensity studies and some statistical analysis that allows 
that both groups to be coherent or to be comparable to each other. So they are saying they got benefited from this very large number, uh, but uh, the, I will briefly uh, filter, uh, mention the filter out, the how, how they, this number uh, went down to 200 patients in each group um, at the end. So uh, one important notice is that they started from uh, 1997. So this is a very large area of, uh, of MS therapy until September 2019. Uh, of course, they didn't include the pediatric populations. Uh, the, uh, what an important issue is the drugs included uh, for the high efficacy DMTs, uh, which were, which were uh, rituximab, ocrelizumab, metoxantrum, alentozumab, or natalizumab. They didn't include the uh, stem cell transplantation. Uh, and uh, there is an important consideration on the subgroups for each treatment, as we will uh, discover a few minutes after. So uh, they applied also uh, a, a, um, an inclusion that, uh, that any given patient has to be on the, on the treatment for at least six months, or any of the above treatments has to be in six, uh, for, for six months. If less or if less than six months, they are excluded. Um, also, they had an operational uh, definition or an empirical definition for early treatment versus late treatment. They defined the early treatment the, if the patient starts from uh, 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 the first two years of the disease also. Uh, and the late in the year four to year six, the years in the middle were excluded and the years after six years were also excluded. So uh, this is a simple graphical uh, representation of the study. So uh, they have a strict, complete baseline data for inclusion. Uh, and this filter out like uh, two to 3,000 patients from its uh, a very large number of patients had been excluded, especially from the MS space because um, of the quality you just mentioned in that. Uh, so uh, this is the, uh, I, I don't know if you see as a mouse or not uh, seeing my pointing uh, on the screen. Yeah, we see it. Okay, very well. So this is a early group, later group. Uh, they have to be followed up for at least six years um, and at least two EDSS measurements during this, this period. Uh, this is, um, uh, a very uh, um, a primary endpoint, a clinical endpoint with the EDSS at point at, at year six to 10 and a confirmed disability progression. As, a, as This was their uh, primary outcome. Uh, they had a secondary outcome for hazard of this discontinuation of the high efficacy treatment. Uh, they didn't have an outcome for the safety for the, uh, because of the data quality. Uh, they, they didn't have enough data about safety of, uh, of the medications of the medication given, so uh, they didn't include any safety outcomes in, in their uh, assessment or their study. So, no. Oh. Good, yeah. Quick question. Hi. Uh, um, I couldn't quite tell from reading it. Is it two years from symptom onset, self-reported symptom onset, or two years from diagnosis? Um, I think uh, diagnosis of uh, MS, uh, as far as I remember. Uh, yes. Or from, no, they say uh, uh, from they disease onset. They say yeah, disease, disease onset. Yes. Yeah. What, what does that mean? I didn't know what that meant. Um, I, I see, it was really a bit confusing for me, but, but as far as I as understand, is the very first um, uh, symptom uh, due to illness. I think uh, not not from the uh, diagnosis or fulfilling the criteria for diagnosis. Because I, I I think that's key thing with these studies, isn't it? That presumably if you go back hard enough and if you if you treat prodromal vague symptoms as symptom onset, then you're going to capture more people and, and presumably you have more benefit to treat earlier. Exactly, yes. And this is one of the considerations in, in the results at the very end, because uh, those who were treated earlier, especially with high efficacy treatments, have longer period of being on treatment and have uh, more benefits for, uh, for, for what we know about MS treatment that we, we, the earlier you start. The, the more benefit you would gain and the outcome uh, on the long term. So yes, that's, uh, that's one, one very valid point. And the um, uh, authors didn't uh, forget to discuss this particular issue as the results. Yes. Um, uh, but but this, this is also intuitive because uh, at, at 1997, we, we didn't have uh, um, 
uh, back to those criteria in the first place. And all over time, the criteria is changing. So the time for diagnosis and, so, and, and the consequence start of disease modifying treatment was heterogeneous, so it's not uh, the same for, for the whole uh, sample. So, 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 so uh, Mohammed, let's just stop here. Does anyone want to have a comment about this type of design in terms of this robustness? Yes. So, uh, Ida, what do you think of the design using um, years four to six? Um, I think uh, it's it's arbitrary because uh, um, um, is, is, there's no uh, it's not uh, I mean it's not based on on, on a scientific uh, rationale of any means. So they are just to to separate patients into two different groups so that they can be uh, included in, uh, in the study. Uh, I no, but, but... Um, yes, yes, Heather. No, but uh, it's either, but uh, so yeah, no, sorry. I just think that the design, of course, this is the design you probably need to make the comparison, but yeah, you obviously, um, it's already in, I mean, they try to compensate it with statistical method, but it must um, induce some sort of bias because the people with late initiation, one way or another, um, they must have more mild MS than the people with with early initiation. And obviously some of the neurologists might be more conservative versus other ones, but yeah, yeah. You would think, or you would think that this study design would induce a sort uh, sort of bias, no? Yes, I mean they do try to address it with the propensity with, match. Yes, but the yes. problem the, the problem is it'll bias the results mm -hmm. the opposite way. You know what I mean? So, but it's also what you see from the demographics table, no? I think you can already a little bit because afterwards they only pick the match tables, but when you look at the initial ones. Um, then you already see that the, the people with this early treatment group, they have higher number of relapses. Um, and high ESS. Higher oh, yes. ESS. So yes. it's very exactly. clear that the early treatment group that, that was in terms of disease, early disease course, not comparable compared to the late, uh, late treatment yes. group, but they try to compensate for it. For it. Yes, but, yes. But, but I think the message is, even though there is this obvious uh, bias in terms of who gets onto these therapies early or late, um, it's biasing the results the opposite way. You know what I mean? Yes, you'd, expect, indeed. you'd expect those people to be doing worse because they've got obviously mm -hmm. more active, more severe early disease. Mm -hmm. so I think we need to keep this in mind that the data set and the methodology they're using uh, is biased, but it's biased mm -hmm. in the opposite direction to what the result show. I'm, I'm jumping in, Mohamed, you go ahead. Yes, yes. <laughs> no, that, that's... Just, so much, just on a quick point. Prof, I, I know what you mean, but it, 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 I, don't, I don't think it's straightforwardly biasing against the results because there's a regression to m the mean phenomenon as well. And presumably the people who have very active disease, presumably they are more likely for their disease to kind of burn out and regress to a, a kind of less active form than the people who have kind of very slow burning insulin disease. Just it, it, intuitively. I, I'm not sure it's straightforwardly biases against the direction that you want to see. Yes. Uh, um, I have a, I have a um, uh, uh, thinking of like the, the, those who had the treatment earlier had uh, definitely some reason to start the treatment earlier. So it might be the disease severity, it might be the... Um, uh, what I don't mention is whether this late treatment group was actually people that were assembled maybe in the, in the 90s versus how many uh, people in the early treatment group were maybe yes. all samples in, in 2000 to 2010, because I think personally that also might bias the results. But they don't. I don't think they ever. They mentioned somewhere whether the 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 time point of sampling of these T of these two groups was significantly different, because it has also been shown that over the years that, you know, especially if you don't have treatment options available, uh, like in the 90s, it also changes the 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 time you diagnose and and uh, yeah, what you consider a relapse. Maybe you know it's. I don't know. I think it can change a lot of these variables that they use in their propensity score matching. Yes, yes, and and I can imagine that um, you you wait a significant time for a patient to start treatment uh, because he's not already been diagnosed according to the available criteria at uh, the early twenties or the late nineties uh, because uh, um, they they still fitting the CIS at that time and at that the criteria at, at, the, at this particular period. So they are more to be pushed into the late treatment group with time. So there is tendency for for er, for the patients uh, included in the 90s or the early 20s to be included in the late treatment group. Uh, 
so so um, uh, I really question the the um, the dichotomization of of these uh, um, uh, time variables. Um, I wonder if if it could be possible um, just to include the time factor of starting and and it just uh, to to be dealt with as a, as a continuous variable rather than separating the two uh, different treatment groups. But I think this is a complete different statistical setup. So, but uh, at the end, this is what they uh, choose to be for the, the design outcome. So as you kindly uh, just mentioned, the, the, um, at the end, uh, the 277 patients in the early uh, treatment group and the late, uh, uh, the 267, uh, are not uh, comparable groups in terms of uh, uh, time to uh, treatment. Uh, or on um, uh, time to diagnosis, uh, excuse me, and the EDSS score. So what they did is that um, they did a propensity uh, uh, score matching for the group. Uh, you, you will notice that the number uh, decreased a little bit um, uh, from the early treatment and also for the late, late treatment group. Despite this, uh, this particular point, it's important to notice that the early treatment group started their first uh, immune therapy earlier, uh, and they had a longer time at any immune therapy, and uh, and also had a longer time at, uh, on any uh, high uh, highly effective uh, disease modifying therapies. So uh, this results. This affects the the outcome at the, at the very end, uh, at the, uh, as we will see in a few minutes. But it's a, an important issue to consider, and this remains this discrepancy remains after propensity score uh, matching. So uh, a quick look also into the uh, treatment, the uh, subgrouping of patients according to treatments. Uh, Ocrelizumab was not represented at all. Uh, at the early group and the late treatment had only uh, two patients. Um, also, uh, the main representative of the high efficacy treatment was Natalizumab, uh, was 87, um, uh, 78% and 72%. Other uh, treatment options were less significantly less represented. So the study also has us, uh, is strongly weighted towards Natalizumab rather than uh, other uh, the, using the generic term for the high efficacy therapies in general. Um, I, I really didn't, did, I was not very convinced to include ocrelizumab with only two patients. It's, it's not uh, a point of strength in, in, uh, in the study. Uh, so, um, okay, I will just go uh, to jump to uh, the results. Uh, so, of course, uh, uh, as it would be expected the the higher uh, the the early treatment group had a lower EDSS uh, for, uh, score uh, at any given time point of follow up uh, from the very early from from uh, year six to seven year seven to eight year eight to nine and year nine to ten and high, lower but at, by at least uh, uh, 0.5 points on EDSS. And at year 9 to 10, they were uh, 0.98 uh, EDSS uh, uh, score uh, lower uh, compared to the late treatment group. Uh, disability progression, uh, as expected, uh, has a lower, uh, the, the early treatment uh, group had a lower um, uh, hazard to uh, the confirm disability progression. And it differs from uh, the how they how did they start the, their analysis? If um, if it is calculated from the date of starting treatment, um, um, it's different from uh, the disease onset, and it's different from um, um, uh, the hazard risk you calculated from year six onwards. It remains significantly lower uh, hazard for uh, confirmed disability progression in the early treatment group, even after uh, both groups started their uh, high efficacy treatments. Uh, for the um, uh, pr uh, probability for discontinuing the hazard for discontinuation of any treatment it was th the same, the hazard uh, ratio was, uh, was the same for both treatment groups. Was no, uh, uh, was no first commenting about this and they were very conservative about commenting about uh, 
safety uh, of, of any uh, of the three uh, groups given. Okay, uh, at the end, they, uh, they report also that um, uh, from the early treatment group, 25, only 25% were remained on the same high, uh, high effects in treatment, uh, on, on high effects treatment in general, and the late treatment was 59%. Uh, uh, those who shifted from the early treatment group, 33% uh, shifted to another, 33% uh, had another high effects treatment, and 22% had uh, shifted to an oral uh, therapies. So uh, that's my, my very rapid, uh, how was not uh, very long, uh, for um, a review of this uh, article. Um, um, and I will leave the uh, discussion for Professor Gannon. Well, no, no, I'm not going to discuss it. So let's um, open up for discussion. So who wants to make a comment? Um, Michael, do you want to make a comment about the implications of this paper for clinical practice? Sorry, I've only been half listening really because I've got some pretty important and stuff going on. Uh, Okay, so let's get Ben to make a comment. Ben, what do you think about data overall? Uh, what, uh, well, I'm going to answer with another question. Uh, what do we think about propensity score matching? So to my mind, uh, we need, in a study like this, which to me rests pretty much entirely on the adequacy of the matching, you need in the results, I would like to see more evaluation of whether that's valid or not. So I'd like to know how mm -hmm. well calibrated it really is. I'd like a much more transparent view of what the actual algorithm is. And to, to me, I mean, I might just be being dense, but I, I, I struggle to understand exactly how they've matched, exactly how adequate that is. Because if that's inadequate, then the whole paper falls down, and that's a huge source of confounding. I don't know what everyone thinks. But they also have to match on a really a huge amount of variables, you know, because they match here on date of birth, sex, treating cent center, date disease onset, confirmation. So it's like a, they, they're, the initial, I mean, the groups aren't so big, so they have a lot of criteria to compensate for. Exactly. And, uh, and what I was wondering is whether they, there's a split. If they've done a training testing split, that's fine. But if they have fitted the regression for the propensity score on these data and then use that model fit to evaluate propensity, it, it's going to be grossly overfit. And then the, the generalizability is, well, who knows? It's probably not generalizable at all. No, but actually the paper just tells us what we already know, no? Don't you think? Well, we kind, of know, we, we kind of know this from, I mean, what I'm trying to say is this is kind of, I think we've got to interpret this in terms of randomized controlled trials. Mm -hmm. So we have a few randomized controlled trials where patients get onto treatment early versus late. Those ones will be the placebo patients mm -hmm. that, get, that then get- And then the um, extension. Extension, and then we've got, other randomized trials where people get randomized to a lower efficacy versus a higher efficacy DMT, and then they, and then they get um, switched over to the more efficacious mm. one in the open label extension. And so in, in those data sets, um, we have pretty good evidence that um, um, the early treatment strategy uh, is effective and, and similarly the high efficacy. Uh, so I think, I think um, Ben, I agree with you that there are issues around propensity scoring. If this was the only data set out there, you wouldn't make too many uh, uh, changes in your practice based on this, but this kind of supports um, what we do, the randomized controlled trials. But the problem about the randomized controlled trials is are they really blinded? And so that's what, that, is, that, is, that has been the issue the FDA always raised with the alemtuzumab trial, yeah. which, which is impossible, impossible to blind alemtuzumab. It's impossible to blind the HACT. It's but it's also impossible to blind most. No? Yep. So the only the, the only treatment trial that we think can, that can be blinded was cladribine, because cladribine you, nobody knew that you know when you actually asked people if they were taking uh, active or placebo there was a 50-50 split so nobody and um, because the drug doesn't cause any side effects but almost all other DMTs it's impossible to to be guaranteed of at least uh, blinding from the patient perspective you know so um, I think the data is what it yeah. is. 
So who? So um, who's on? Who's on, So let's ask Ruth. Ruth. Yeah. So I. So I don't know much about propensity propensity scoring, and I missed the first half of the talk. I'm sorry because I'm on call and I was taking referrals. But um, I was just going to ask whether that um, it may and it may have come up in the discussion. Did they do any subgroup analysis? Because obviously there's a whole range of DMTs that they'd kind of looked at. Was there any difference? Um, in the kind of, did they do any subgroup analysis? Is that going to impact on our findings? I mean, overall, it seems like a, you know, an, an kind of a nice support, nice supporting evidence for starting DMTs early on. Yeah. Yeah. And for and potentially offering or starting high efficacy DMTs. High efficacy, yeah, exactly. Um, so there's, there's, so there's two principles that this underpins. It's the early early treatment and the uh, you do better if with you high efficacy yeah high efficacy therapies early on so um, definitely if i was to read this paper i'd i feel more comfortable about yeah starting someone early on with a high efficacy kind of um disease modifying agent um but yeah so i didn't catch the beginning of it so i haven't read the the, the paper i'm sorry but i was just wondering you know it's a it's a, a lot of agents that are listed here and was there any kind of yeah subgroup analysis or any further well, no, interpretation I, I, oh, of that yeah. sorry yeah. Mohammed. no 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 I, I was just replying because the, the, they didn't uh did this, they didn't do any subgroup analysis for treatments for different treatment options no no, no it's just uh, stating just the the whole sample overall yes. let's give them start them early with something strong yes yeah, so, so I, th I think I don't think there's enough numbers to be honest with you. There won't be enough power. Fair enough. Yeah. In the, I mean, I would say, yeah. yeah. Um, and can someone explain propensity scoring to me? Okay, so let me give you the the lowdown. So what happens is in a randomized controlled trial, you ran you rely on the randomized randomization process to even out in terms of the uh, potential biases, the, the things you can't control for like sex and age and center and all that. So when you actually analyze them, you hope that the groups are balanced. So yeah. when you do propensity scoring, you've got a much bigger data set. And what you do is you pull one individual out and then you go and use a, a, um, an algorithm that's based on a whole lot of variables to pull a similar patient out and match them. So they become matched. So what you're basically doing is trying to match two groups that are similar in those characteristics you put into the model. Uh, unfortunately, propensity scoring is dictated by what you've collected. So it, it's dictated by the data set you've got. Uh, it doesn't take into account uh, uh, hidden biases that you can't account for because you haven't collected the data. So, so uh, I mean, uh, some of the biases that you missed, uh, Ida referred to, uh, the, the epoch and when they were diagnosed, how many came from an earlier epoch versus a late epoch. Yeah. Um, the, there is this phenomenon in uh, in MS which happens in all diseases called the Will Rogers effect. So Will Rogers was an uh, um, he was a uh, comedian that lived in Hollywood during the 1930s, and he was very famous for saying that when the Okies from Oklahoma migrated to California, um, they they raised the average intelligence in both states, um, and people laughed at that. <laughs> People laugh at that joke, but it's actually quite quite clear. Is when you actually take people that were like CIS, and you now make them MS, you improve the prognosis of the remaining CIS patients. And the and so when you when you when you move the boundary between diagnostic groups, you actually improve mm -hmm. the prognosis in both groups. And this is now known in prostate cancer. This has mm -hmm. been shown in thyroid cancer. It's been shown in many malignancies. When you change the diagnostic criteria, what was considered to be not prostate cancer in the past, and now you bring uh, asymptomatic people with raised PSAs and you actually improve the prognosis of what's called prostate cancer and what's called mm. cancer. And so that's um, what's happened is we, we've actually changed our diagnostic criteria in MS quite a few times during this, this, during this uh, data collection period. And I'm almost certain the Will Rogers effect would have happened. So people diagnosed mm -hmm. later would have a better prognosis because of the criteria they were diagnosed with. So mm -hmm. they, that's a bias that's not uh, incorporated necessarily into this data set uh, that I'm aware of. They, they did try and do it with date of birth, but that doesn't really capture the uh, age of onset here. Yes, but, uh... but the date of birth was not in the propensity score matching. It was the age of disease onset. 
But that, so that's the age of disease onset doesn't capture the time when they no, were diagnosed. No, there is no, so it's only indirectly because they own also included the delay from first symptom to clinically definite, but then the clinically definite has changed throughout the time. And then, um, yeah, that, that's the only actually real variable that might be linked to the, the date of diagnosis. But do you think the, the age of uh, diagnosis, the age of diagnosis, really alters the response to, um, to, the, to any given disease modifying treatment? Like when, you, when, when patients get older, they usually, regardless of their symptoms or their disability, at disease onset, they, they have a, a less response to uh, disease modifying treatment in general. So now, so the question I want to ask is that you mentioned, um, Mohammed, that there are two trials going on in the United States. One of them is actually in the UK as well. Um, comparing uh, comparing yes. the two treatment strategies. Okay. Yes, yes, very well. So um, as I, I just uh, dig them up, I will just show one. Um, is this, there's one um, running on the Cleveland Clinic, uh, University of Nottingham. Uh, currently recruiting, uh, they expect to finish at 2020, uh, their um, uh, study, uh, they include. Uh, they define the high, high efficacy treatment with uh, alentezumab, ocrelozumab, nitalizumab, and rituximab. They just include these, only these categories, and the escalation involves the, um, the uh, platform services that are as we would expect. The other one uh, is from, as far as I remember, Johns Hopkins. Yes, uh, yeah. Uh, also to uh, expected, uh, started 2018 and, and expected to finish 2020 uh, at Johns Hopkins University. And they are including um, natalizumab, alentazumab, ocrelizumab, and rituximab at the high efficacy uh, arm and the platform therapies at, uh, uh, on the other. Okay. Yeah, so, so one of the things is I wrote an editorial in, the, in, this, in this particular journal on, the, on those two trials. And I was questioning, uh, given the evidence base, both on the randomized trials and now this, mm -hmm. this wasn't out back then, you know, whether we have equipoise, you know, can you really randomize a patient? Can you really randomize a patient to, um, uh, a trial where you where you've got data like this. I don't know, the question I want to ask, Ben, what do you? For you let's give some medical ethics here. Do you think it's ethical to randomise a patient to uh, um, say a low efficacy therapy or a high efficacy therapy in the current environment? I don't think this trial um, has any bearing. This this study has any bearing on that. I, I really don't think the observational evidence can influence that decision at all. Actually, and unless it's much clearer how people are stratified. Um, I mean, in terms of the trial data, yeah, I think we probably don't have equipoise anymore. So I think for young people with clinically definite MS, lots of activity, I think it, it probably is unethical at this stage. I mean, it's obviously patient choice, but I think it's unethical to not offer a high efficacy DMC if there's no diagnostic uncertainty, they've got active disease, they've got no contraindication. I think it's probably, yeah, unethical to not offer it. Uh, Ida, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> no, I, will, I really agree. I think especially if you look at the data, uh, we have direct comparisons b between the low efficacy therapies and the high efficacy therapies. And they're so much better in all the, in all the uh, primary and secondary outcome measures that why are we, yeah, I think anything should be compared with high efficacy now. So maybe they should try to compare high efficacy versus high efficacy. That would be <laughs> informative <laughs> and help yeah. us on which one to choose <laughs> yeah i mean that's what happened i mean we actually our center designed um the trial we called it the NIDA trial it was back in 2014 um and we literally within two years we we Das and myself and you know, the rest of us decided that you know we couldn't we didn't have equipoise we really couldn't be part of that uh, trial so we did actually hand over the study to um, Nikos Evangelou and uh, Matt Craner, who tried to get it funded by our NIHR. Mm -hmm. It was rejected, but then that, that trial, the ideas behind that trial were recycled into the, into the uh, um, Deliver MS trial, which was funded by the PCORI Institute in the United States. And we actually, as a center, made the call, you know, given the current evidence base, not this evidence, but given the other evidence base, that 
we felt that we didn't have equipoise. And there, there's disagreements mm -hmm. on this. Some people are saying there is equipoise, and some people are saying not. But then, you know, I suppose equipoise depends on how you practice um, and interpret the data. Um, no, but then I think indeed much more time should be invested in in like um, other tries like Oculismab versus Oculismab um, or maybe cladribine plus cladribine plus teriflunomide or something like that kind of things would be much more interesting to know because we already, I think not, it's not about this trial, but there are so many, there is so many evidence around that early treatment is better in so many ways that I wouldn't waste any more energy on it. It's now time for the next <laughs> the next uh, line of research, no? Yeah, so, but that, so, that, so that particular trial, I mean, this correction wasn't about delayed treatment, it was about um, low efficacy, you know, what I'll call it maintenance escalation, mm -hmm. starting at a platform and moving up versus uh, flipping mm -hmm. the pyramid and going high efficacy first line. So it is the other issue in this trial. It's the difference between low efficacy platforms versus the high efficacy on our... Mm -hmm. I'm, I mean, okay. the, the, yeah. so, sorry, Ben? No, no, you, you finish. No, no, that's, so I think that's where the equipoise, we've lost equipoise. I think anybody who now thinks that we should do a trial of delaying access to treatment versus early access to treatment, that's a very, that's a very, that's happened, that actual question is now happening in, in, in asymptomatic MS. There's trials going on in radiologic outside syndrome from our last week's discussion, mm -hmm. where we're actually starting treatment as early as possible when we pick them up in asymptomatic disease versus placebo. So, you know, we've got equipoise there because we've got nothing licensed there. So that question has moved to asymptomatic MS. It's not part yeah, of the yeah. spectrum. So, and because I was also surprised how, um, so in this study, they still use a lot of mitoxantrone. How does that actually compare to, um, to rituximab or alemtuzumab? Probably there's no data for that, but. What yeah, I think do? I think the rituximab, the rituximab may be just because of the uh, legacy. These patients were treated in the past. Mm -hmm. um, to be honest with you, most um, centers now considering the risk profile of mitoxantrone, particularly yeah. the leukemia risk, also yeah. the infertility risk and the and the myocardial. Yeah. Um, most centers now have stopped using uh, mitoxantrone, um, unless you unless you're living in a resource poor poor country where you can't afford the uh, licensed DMTs, you know, I would argue from an economic reason, you could justify using mitoxantrone in, in some some sure. other environments. I, 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 excuse me, uh, I had an experience with with similar conditions in Egypt, but we we usually usually we use um, uh, endoxane uh, rather than metoxantrone. Uh, I, I, this was one of my questions uh, already about the study. Why, why they didn't include uh, endoxan in, in treatment in, in, uh, as a high efficacy treatment because it remains sometimes in the literature for a good period of time uh, at the early 20s. Yeah, I think one of the reasons why we use mitoxantrone rather than cyclophosphamide is because mitoxantrone is actually a licensed therapy that's got yep. licensed in three European countries, France, Germany, and Austria. And it's also got licensed in the United States. So it's kind of a, one of the licensed treatments where cyclophosphamide hasn't been licensed as a treatment in any country. So I think, yeah. uh, I think this is, this is a point. This, but they've got rituximab on the list and rituximab isn't licensed. So, you know, so it, yeah. it just depends on, I think it just depends on the bias of the MS-based data set, which is t tends to be biased by European uh, databases rather yeah. than uh, other ones. Ben, you wanted to make a comment. I saw you were making a comment there. No, no, I was just going to ask out of interest, what, what argument do the drug companies give to, to get new uh, trials with high efficacy versus low or nothing? Yep, uh, that's a big question. Um, we've, we've actually had this debate many, many times is, you know, is it ethical? Um, and I don't think it is ethical on uh, efficacy grounds. It may be ethical on um, grounds where people still don't want to have uh, irreversible intravenous therapies, whatever. So you could argue mm -hmm. that patient um, preference. Yeah, but um, we get into the stage based on the data sets we have. It's going to be very difficult to do trials of you know, new high efficacy therapies against uh, low efficacy therapies. And I sit on these steering committees. We have these debates all the time. We we get into that stage where we were about ten years ago, where it was unethical to do placebo controlled trials anymore. And I mm -hmm. think we get into the stage where it's going to be unethical to do um, head-to-head, uh, head-to-heads with a low-efficacy drug based yeah. on this 
these data sets. Um, but the question then is, if you could do it against a high efficacy theory, you just, it's, it's very difficult to power and make it economically viable. So we get into a stage where we're gonna have to think about more creative um, you know, uh, outcome measures that give us using a surrogate endpoint rather than a clinical endpoint. And I think the, the regulatory authorities are gonna have to come to the realization that we're going to have to move to a surrogate endpoint. And I suspect once we get to a surrogate endpoint, like brain volume loss or, mm -hmm. or, or one of those, then we can uh, do two high efficacy therapies relative to us because what we're going to be starting to look for is marginal gains. Mm -hmm. big gains you know? but, uh, is, there any, uh, is there any suggestion that multi-arm trials would be possible? I know getting all the drug companies to sit together in a room and pay for the same trial would be difficult, but... You know, as we learned from COVID, these multi-arm trials can be scalable and very effective. And that's the only way, because otherwise you can't compare between the phase three RCTs, can you? It's apples and pears. No. No, what, no, do you, what, what do you mean with multi-arm? Yes, what, adaptive, what? adaptive design. They do this in oncology. You, 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 mm. What happens is you, you just start new arms as you get new treatments. So actually, Jeremy mm. Chataway tried to get this funded in the UK. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we've put forward an idea to pharma to start uh, multi-armed adaptive platforms where you actually build up uh, and, um, and co comparative arms and you have to have a comparative platform therapy. And, you know, we suggested that one of them should be dimethyl fumarate because there's so many people on Tecfidera and the other one should be ocrelizumab. And then what happens is you compare drugs to those, plat to those platforms mm -hmm. and see if you can improve outcomes. Um, I think it'll only work, Ben, if the pharmaceutical companies concerned own the platform and they're comparing or wanting to improve relative to their drug. I think, um, you know, the motivation for them would be that they could own a platform that has their drug as the platform, Tecfidera, and you're comparing to that, or Ocrelizumab comparing to that. But I don't think uh, none of the companies bought um, the concept, so, you know, which is a tragedy. Guys, I'm going to have to log off. So if there's any other questions. No, I, no thank you. you. I just wanted to mention that the next journal group will be on the 9th of September. Um, so if anybody would be interested in presenting, you can always send me an email and then I can put you on the list. Ben, you got some genomics paper you want to do? Yeah, I, I'm away uh, on the 9th, but I can do the week after. Okay. Uh, yeah, perfect. Yeah. I'll put you on the list, Ben. <laughs> can you remind me? Bye. I forget. Thanks. Right, thanks, guys. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.